I have a message this morning uh, entitled The Faith Challenges of the Apostle Paul. You know, been doing quite a series on faith here over the past several weeks. Uh, you know, our big challenge really is our faith. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at <clears throat> some of the issues that the Apostle Peter had to go through on his journey. And today, I wanted to look at the Apostle Paul. And uh, I have quite a few slides in this presentation. Uh, I found out, you know, we had to use big print in order <clears throat> for people like Anita and Blake and Ann back there to be able to see. So uh, that means more slides, you know, with uh, less information on each one. <clears throat> so the early life of Paul, Saul of Tarsus, as he was known, he was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, which would be a little part of Turkey today. Um, he was actually born with Roman citizenship. This is really the hand of God. Uh, you know, he told us in one place that he was marked out as an apostle uh, from his mother's womb. So the Lord actually set things up so that he had Roman citizenship as well as a sidekick of his that came along, uh, Silas. Okay? Uh, he was educated under, in Jerusalem under the famous Rabbi Gamaliel. He tells us that. And the way he put it in Acts chapter 26, verse 4, he said, So then, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Okay. The uh, Pharisees, I want to talk about them just briefly. The Pharisees were a sect uh, that began about 150 B.C. What had happened is the uh, Syrian Greeks had come in from the north. Uh, they captured the temple area. They uh, desecrated it. They sacrificed a pig on the big altar out in front and uh, sprinkled the temple with pig broth. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, under the leadership of some people called the Maccabees, they, they drove the Syrian Greeks out and they actually had to dedicate the temple. And uh, one of the questions in the bulletin today was, uh, you know, uh, about that feast of dedication, when was it? And uh, it actually mentioned it in the scripture. So the Pharisees were a group that began then saying, okay, we've got to be sure that we get back to the law. We've got to be sure that we get back to the teachings of the scripture. And uh, trouble is they ended up being both the interpreters and the, the, of, and, of the law and the enforcers of their traditions in addition to the law. And so that, you know, that's why Jesus doesn't have a lot of respect for most Pharisees. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You know, he said, you go around the land and see to make one convert, and after you get a hold of him, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. See, so uh, Jesus is pretty upset about the fact that these guys were actually going beyond uh, what the scripture said. Well, Saul of Tarsus was one of those, okay? Uh, he uh, testified later on on trial one time before the uh, Roman governor Festus and, and King Agrippa. He said, these Jews, since they have known about me for a long time, if they're willing to testify, he said that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. Okay? I mean, he was not only a Pharisee, he was a, <coughs> a strictest sect of the Pharisees. He said, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. See how he's putting the traditions. So a lot of times your New Testament will talk about the law and the customs. Put the law and the customs together. And that's what the Pharisees and the scribes were in the process of enforcing. Um, he was part of the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin was the uh, Jewish high council. It was sometimes called the Council of Seventy. Kind of goes back to the time when Moses uh, got captains of, of hundreds and captains of thousands. I think he ended up with about seventy. And so that kind of continued on uh, with the tradition. And so the Sanhedrin, half of it was about Pharisees, half of them were, were Sadducees. The Sadducees were the priests and the guys that governed the temple. So when Paul's listing these credentials at one point, he said, I was circumcised the eighth day uh, of the nation Israel, tribe of Benjamin. He said, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. Hebrew of Hebrews means he's a teacher of the teachers. See, he's a young man. See, but he's advanced beyond his countrymen. He's, you know, right from the beginning, Saul of Tarsus is a very zealous, hot, on fire individual. And that's going to play out as we, we see this, the faith challenges of Paul, the Apostle Paul go on. 
on trial, another point, he said, not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, but also when they were put to death, being put to death, he said, I cast my vote against them. See, he was on the Sanhedrin as a young man. There's nobody more Jewish than Saul of Tarsus. You know, I always have a picture of the old boy sitting there kind of stroking their beards and saying, yep, things are in good hands. We pass on. Saul of Tarsus has got it. Nothing to worry about, guys. We can die in peace. Okay. Uh, he was hot. He was intense. He advanced. And he was in a great position of leadership. The, uh, eventually, it came time for him to bring charges against Stephen. Um, Stephen, of course, was one of the guys set aside by the laying ons of the apostles in Acts chapter 6. Ended up doing a lot of preaching and teaching. And uh, so in Acts 6, 9, it says, Some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and start, argued with Stephen. Okay? Now I put <coughs> Cilicia in, in a little bit bolder type there because that's where Saul of Tarsus was. That lets you know Saul of Tarsus was one of these guys. Uh, the synagogue of the freedmen, that would tell you a lot, just the name of that right there. These are the... These are guys, that, you know, a little bit more, I guess we might call them the redneck of the, uh, the Jewish uh, guys, and uh, pretty, pretty hot, pretty intense. See, and Saul of Tarsus looks like he was in with those. And uh, so when they argued with Stephen, you know, they couldn't cope with the wisdom or the spirit with what they spoke. So when they'd driven him out of the city after uh, Stephen testified before the council in Acts 7, uh, when they'd driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, as we can tell from, from the Jewish custom, the uh, person that brought the charges cast the first stone and then held the coats of everybody else. Okay, that's why when uh, they brought a woman to Jesus, uh, you know, they said, we caught this woman in adultery, the very act. And Jesus didn't answer anything for a while. And uh, finally, he sat up and he said, well... Uh, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to cast a stone at her. See, and then he just stooped down and continued to, to write on the ground. Well, they, you know, they all went out one by one because, they, you know, they recognized that they had sin and, uh, and, and couldn't actually be the first one to throw the stone. So it looks like Saul's the lead guy on this. You bring in the initial charges, cast in the first stone, and then holding the coats. It's the holding the coats is the only thing referred to in the New Testament. He was there. And uh, so one of the points I'm going to make is, is he heard the preaching. Right from the beginning, he heard the preaching about Jesus. It says uh, then, from that point on, Saul began ravaging the church, persecuted the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He'd put them in prison. See, to me, that's... Incredible! You go in the house, you take the men, the women, and leave the kids squalling in the house, uh, dogs running loose, uh, whatever, and uh, the men and women are gone in prison. Okay, you know, as he said, he he cast his vote against them, uh, the vote being to be executed for blasphemy, blasphemy gone. He said, "I persecuted uh, this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons." Pretty hot, pretty intense guy. The Bible says he was breathing threats and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. The reasons for Saul's disbelief, you know, it was, wasn't that he hadn't heard. Saul of Tarsus heard the message going back to the days of Stephen. Uh, he just couldn't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and therefore was God. See, the Christians were making the claim that because Jesus was raised from the dead, Jesus is God. See, it goes clear back to when Thomas figured that out. You know, when after Jesus raised from the dead, he appeared to 10 of the apostles at one time. Um, Thomas wasn't there. And so the other guys said, hey, Thomas, you know, we saw him. Thomas says, I'm not going to believe until I put my fingers in the nail holes and put my hands in the sign. So about a week later, Jesus shows up right in the middle of him. And I just kind of picture Jesus saying to Thomas, come here, boy. You know, he says, reach here your finger and put it into the nail holes. Reach here your hand put it into my side, do not be unbelieving, but be believing. Scripture doesn't record it, but I have a picture of Thomas actually hitting the deck and saying, my Lord 
and my God. See, he recognized that Jesus was God. Saul of Tarsus is not buying that. See, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead proves that he is God. Saul of Tarsus said, no way. Heaven can't contain it. Solomon said, heaven can't contain God, much less this temple I built. How about a, a human body? Saul of Tarsus is not buying, not believing. And uh, Jesus had prophesied about people like Saul. He said, an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he's offering service to God. See, that's, you know, if you think that somebody's blaspheming in a Jewish situation, uh, no, that's what you do. You put them to death. So Saul of Tarsus uh, thought he was doing God's duty. Uh, it's kind of clear at one point that he had a few nagging doubts back there someplace. Uh, Jesus said to him when Jesus appeared to him on the Damascus Road, as recorded in Acts 26, he said, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Okay. But Saul of Tarsus you know, might have blocked that out, but he's on the mission then to persecute these guys he regards as blaspheme. So I estimate uh, Saul of Tarsus then on the road to Damascus in about uh, 35 A.D. You know, I mean, the church began 30. Um, the persecution began pretty shortly after the church came off the ground. And so uh, Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9 is on his way to D Damascus. And I put a little map up there for you to get an idea. It's about 120 miles uh, from um, uh, Jerusalem to Damascus gives you an idea, roughly from here to Laurel or here to Deer Lodge, give you an idea. So he's on that, on that trip, and his goal is to round up uh, Christians and uh, bring them back to Jerusalem for trial. Okay? But he's just outside of Damascus when he meets Jesus on the Damascus Road. The way he describes it, he was uh, blinded, and uh, he fell to the ground. He said, I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay, in Acts 22, 7. And uh, he, he said, I answered, who are you, Lord? Now, when he said, who are you, Lord, he doesn't know who he's talking to at this point. And he said to me, I'm Jesus. Yep, the one from Nazareth. No, there's a lot of Jesus around, but this one's from Nazareth, and the one's well known, okay, by this point, whom you are persecuting. And I always like those words. When the church is getting persecuted, Jesus takes it personally. You're persecuting me. You, you touch my people, you're touching me. See, that, you know, may need that piece of information ourselves down the road here. See, now at this point, Saul of Tarsus believed that the message of the gospel was true. See, in other words, when the voice comes back and said, yep, I am Jesus, pretty clear that the voice that's talking to him is alive. And if the voice that's talking to him alive is Jesus of Nazareth, then Jesus of Nazareth is alive. And if Jesus of Nazareth is alive, then the testimony of the Christians is true, and Saul of Tarsus is in big trouble. See, so at that point, he, he believes in Jesus, okay? Um, he's also repentant. He says, uh, what shall I do, Lord? And uh, at that, you know, when he said, what shall I do, Lord, it's, it's, it's not like, all right, what do you want me to do now? It's like, okay, Lord, what... What do you want me to do? He's, he's a repentant individual. Whatever God wants him to do, he'll do. Okay. And he's confessed Jesus as Lord, knowing exactly what he means by that statement. And then three days later, he obeys the command to arise and be immersed and wash away your sin, calling on his name. So that's the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus is not conversed, uh, converted until he's immersed. So that's why sometimes we have a little bumper sticker that says, Conversion in Immersion. Okay. Not until. If you read these books, I got a book on the Apostle Paul. It was published by the Billy Graham Publishing House on the life of the Apostle Paul. And I thought, well, I'll start reading this and see what's there. And they do pretty good until they get down to Paul's conversion. And they try to have it that he was converted on the Damascus Road. And then they throw Acts 22:16, immersed and washed away sin. But they don't comment on it. Just put it in there and keep going. Uh, because... You know, that verse really contravenes everything they think. That's the scripture, though. And so now he's, see, now he's, he's on the faith journey. And uh, his newfound faith is going to be put to the test and put to the test right out of the chute. So you're going to see the, the character of, of Saul of Tarsus slash the Apostle Paul as he faced these tests going through. And really to see what a great man of faith 
uh, he is. So immediately he began teaching the synagogues, the way Acts 9.20 put it, immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he's the Son of God. Now think of that. Just, I mean, here's the guy who just got immersed, right? And as we'll see, the full load of apostleship hasn't dropped on him yet. He's, he, he's, at this point, he's just a teacher. I mean, he's, he's taken what, he's, what he knows from the Old Testament, which is considerable. And, uh, you know, he's applying it to Jesus, and he's teaching in the synagogues, saying he is the Son of God. Now think of the courage it takes to go right into a synagogue. He was headed to the synagogues uh, in, in Jerusalem, I mean, Damascus, to, to find the names of, of Christians, of saints, in Damascus and bring him back to Jerusalem for punishment. Now he's standing in the same synagogue that he was going to use as his allies to help him round up Christians. And he's standing and preaching to those guys, Jesus is the Son of God. How well you think that's going to go over? See? And, and does he know that going in? Yeah, he does. He was one. He was one of those. Um, it goes on to say that Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Okay? That word proof there is a pretty strong word. Uh, he's actually proven it. Okay? Well, he had to leave Damascus, and so in Galatians it lets us know that he went away to Arabia for three years. I kind of put this about 36 to 39 A.D. Um, he said, I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which preached by me was not according to man, Neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, that's going to be really important down the road, because you got the other apostles who are actual physical witnesses of Jesus, who, you know, received, you know, the teaching along the way, got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and uh, were able to preach then based also on their own eyewitness account. Saul of Tarsus you know, or the later the Apostle Paul, he always calls himself a witness, a witness of the resurrection, but he's a witness by revelation. So what God did is he had a, the apostles here, then he had an independent source over here, see, which ended up be re, being really important in keeping the early church on track. So Paul's pretty emphatic about it. He said, I, you know, I didn't, I, nobody taught me this stuff. I received it directly by revelation. That's why when Paul's talking about the Lord's Supper in, in Acts chapter 11, verse 23, he said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. Okay? So he received it by revelation. Okay? So after spending those three years in Arabia, personal opinion is that's where God just essentially walking uh, Saul of Tarsus through by revelation the same thing that the other guys got to walk through in a physical way. Um, by the way, Luke's gospel is really Paul's gospel. You know, Luke, when he talks about it, he's, he opened it up by saying, he said, I did a, a lot of investigation. You can tell that, that Luke is a very close associate of Paul. I mean, right near the end, Paul says, only Luke is with me. So Paul is one of the major sources of information for Luke's gospel. And it, Luke is, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospel. Synoptic means with the same eye. So that's why a lot of the same things that are in Matthew and Mark are also in Luke. But that's coming from the independent source, Paul, as contrasted to what Matthew was an eyewitness of. Mark's gospel is really a lot of information came from Peter. So you got Matthew's eyewitness account, you got Peter's eyewitness account, you got John's eyewitness account, and you got Paul's eyewitness account. And Paul's eyewitness account lines up exactly with the other ones. See, that tells you how, how good that revelation was. So he came back to Damascus and uh, says, When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their plot became known to, to Saul. Why? I mean, these guys are upset. See, he comes, into the, comes back into the synagogue. This guy is a man of faith. He believes that when he goes in and preaches, he can get some results. He doesn't care if it's one or two or five, but he, if he can get some results, he's going to be happy. See, it takes a lot of faith to do that because he's in the process of overcoming a lot of discouragement here. Uh, their plot became known to Saul. Um, you know, I've never had anybody, as far as I know, try to take my life or plot to take, you know, they've tried to take my reputation, a lot of other things, but I never had anybody trying to kill me. So 
I don't know as I can really experience this, but it caused me to think, okay, they're tr trying to do away with him, trying to kill him. They're also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket, which he also refers to later in one of the letters. Okay, So that's his first preaching stint, Damascus. Okay, uh, Then he goes on to Jerusalem. I put this about 41 A.D. Uh, when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. They are all afraid of him, not believing he's a disciple. So he comes up and everybody's backing away. Say, I don't, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with that guy. Uh, we remember him, you know. And uh, uh, Barnabas actually kind of took him by the hand and introduced him to the apostles. And, uh, and uh, you know, but, you know, he was with them, uh, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. Okay. It's interesting he uses the phrase arguing. You know, I mean, Paul would get in and mix it up with these guys. You know, and, you know um, somebody sent me a text. You know, I used some quotes from this uh, Matt Slick here for a, a while ago in the Bible school class. And... Uh, you know, somebody says that Matt Slick has debates. And so, you know, I'm thinking about maybe seeing if I could get on the debate slot with, with Matt Slick and, and uh, talk about whether immersion is necessary for salvation or not. Um, you know, Saul of Tarsus, he wasn't afraid to get in and mix it up. Um, you know, arguments are tough. You know, I, I don't like arguments personally. Um, you know, I'd like, I like discussions to go peaceably. I like, uh, you know, people be able to reason clearly. If you've got a point, make your point back with Scripture. Let's talk about it. Um, but generally, it doesn't go that way. You know, when people got their minds made up about something, uh, they can be pretty hard-headed and hard to deal with. So he's arguing with the Jews, and they're putting him to, trying to put him to death. So he's got to clear out of town. So he goes uh, to Tarsus. When the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea, down to the seacoast, Send him back to Tarsus, back to the home stomping ground. So uh, now, after this, you know, the, uh, the Gentiles are converted in Acts chapter 10. The brethren that were scattered pretty quick, uh, they start preaching and converting the Gentiles. And uh, especially in the Antioch of Syria. And it says in Acts 11, 25 and 26, considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. See, and so the church had actually sent Barnabas down to Antioch. Church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas down to Antioch. He got there, and uh, it's more than he could handle. So he left uh, for Tarsus to look for Saul. Remember, he's the guy that introduced Saul to the apostles. So he knows him, and he knows he's from Tarsus. So he goes up to Tarsus, tracks him down. Um, and when he found him, he brought him to, to Antioch. I often wondered what it was like trying to track somebody down in those days. I mean... You know, they didn't have a Facebook presence, so how are you going to contact them, you know? Uh, but they did. So he brings them to Antioch, okay? And uh, so here's a little map. You can see Damascus kind of down on the, on the lower right on the map, and then you see Antioch uh, further north, and uh, then you can see Tarsus on the left. You can see that the distance from Antioch to Tarsus uh, by land is about, this is the same map I showed you earlier, uh, so you can see the distance from Antioch to Tarsus is about the same as Jerusalem to Damascus, about 120 miles. So um, not that far over. Uh, just where that number seven is, I don't know if you can see that, uh, that red dot there near the top. There's a, a pass there called the Cilician Gates, and uh, it's the rugged mountain ranges. Uh, you couldn't put California Highway 1 along that, that south coast of what's now Turkey. So they had to go through that, that pass called Cilician Gates. So Cilician, Tarsus was the main jumping off point to, to go into the interior, you know, where these, these other provinces of Rome are. So Saul and, and Barnabas and Saul says for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, once again, you can see Saul of Tarsus being a good team player, working with Barnabas, uh, getting in, doing a lot of teaching. And the um, problem in Antioch is you have a lot of Jews that were Christians, and now you've got all these Gentiles that are coming. And the name Christian doesn't exist at this point. 
So the, the Jewish converts were generally called disciples of Christ, which kind of had the context of a sect of the Jews that were followers of Jesus. Okay, well, that's not going to apply to the Gentiles. They're, they're, they're not going to be a sect of the Jews that are followers of Christ. So they come up with a new name. And if you kind of tear the Greek apart there a little bit, it was actually Paul and Barnabas that first called the disciples Christians at Antioch. See, that's how the name Christian came into existence, through Paul and Barnabas. Again, that's a significant point in the, in the history of the church. And Saul of Tarsus, a uh, man of faith, was greatly involved in that. So at this point, the famine had come on uh, the land of Judea. So the church in Antioch determined to send a contribution uh, for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending the charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. This is the first reference to the elders in Jerusalem. But notice that the guys that the church is comfortable with handling the money, whatever chunk of cash it was, going to Jerusalem was Barnabas and Saul. See? Again, he's a trustworthy guy obviously has the respect of the church at Antioch. Okay, at one point then, you know, the, the church, the leadership of Antioch is going to meet together. And I needed to bring something in from 2 Timothy here to, to make a point what's going to go on in Acts 13. Paul talked about the gospel. He said, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. Those are the three offices that, uh, that Paul held, okay? And so, there, was, there were at Antioch, see, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers. Okay? Barnabas, you know, Simon was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Okay? So notice that Saul's not a prophet. He never calls himself a prophet. Uh, so you can tell all he is at this point is a teacher. Prophets and teachers, that's what there was in the church at Antioch. Okay? So the, while they were ministering to the Lord then, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So when they'd fasted and prayed and laid the hands on them, they sent them away. Now, at this point, Barnabas and, and Saul are apostles of the church in Antioch. There's apostles of Jesus Christ. See, when Paul opens his letter, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. But you not only have apostles of Christ, but you also have apostles of churches. And uh, the Latin equivalent, apostles a Greek word, the Latin equivalent is missionary. That's why these are called the, the, the first missionary journey of Barnabas and Saul. So they're, from the perspective of the congregation at Antioch, they're apostles of the church. From the perspective of the guys they're preaching to, they're evangelists or, teacher, or preachers. See, that's, this is the point at which Paul is appointed a preacher. He's a teacher. Now he's appointed a preacher through the laying on of hands of the leadership. And they sent him away. Uh, first then they went, and this is beginning about 46 A.D. And uh, so they sent him away. Uh, they, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. Seleucia is the port city for Antioch. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. Uh, if you go back and read uh, Barnabas' history, Barnabas was Joseph uh, in Acts chapter 4, a Levite from Cyprus. So the natural place for, for Paul and Barnabas to go on their first missionary journey is Cyprus. Okay? So they hit the synagogues on the east side of the island, worked their way to the west. Finally, they're at a place uh, called Salamis. So Paul, at this point, is a preacher. He's an evangelist. Okay. Now on the west side of the island, they were, they were summoned by the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. Uh, that always strikes me a bit because, uh, you know, the Bible doesn't usually call people men of intelligence. So this guy must have been a pretty special guy. Okay? And uh, this man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So he had this guy by the name of Elimus the magician, who's also called Bar-Jesus. He was a Jewish false prophet. He was doing everything he can and could to twist the scriptures and turn the proconsul away from the things that uh, Barnabas and, and, and Saul are teaching, see. But Saul, see, and then Luke's going to note the name change here. Saul, who's also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and sent blindness on him. You know, now, Saul's a pretty fiery guy. He said, you know, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease making crooked the straight way of the Lord? 
See, behold, a mist and a blindness will come upon you. You'll be blind, not be able to see the sun for a time. So the guy now he's wandering around trying to find somebody to take his hand and lead him. See, Saul's a f now he's Paul, a fiery guy. And this is the first miracle that he performs when he blinds the opposition. See, so this is now full bone the Apostle Paul. He's gone from teacher to preacher, which he still holds those offices, by the way. And now he's the, he's the great Apostle Paul, ready to do the things that God has ultimately prepared him to do. As I mentioned earlier, he was marked out as an apostle from his mother's womb. Teacher, preacher, apostle of Jesus Christ. His conversion to his apostleship, uh, Wilson estimate from about 35 AD to about 46. So I, I'm thinking 10, 11 years. Oh, he's in the process of developing along the guidelines that God wants him to develop so that he can do the apostle job that God wants him to do. So leaving the island of Cyprus, they crossed to the mainland. They hit Antioch of Pisidia. Okay? So they go into the synagogue. They don't know anybody there. Okay? Walk in. Okay? They've been preaching in the synagogues of, of Cyprus. Okay? So they walk into this one. Okay? And after the reading of the law of the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. So Paul, you know, he jumps up, motions with his hand, starts preaching. Okay. Again, this is a great man of faith, if you think about it. They walk into the synagogue. They don't know what opportunity they're going to get. Okay. <clears throat> Ready to take it, see. The Lord opens the door for him. The guy said, hey, you guys got anything to say? Say it. So what's he going to do? Can he mollycoddle? Uh, you know, try to reach common ground with the, with the Jewish element there and, and uh, you know, just deliver a little bit of message here and a little bit more of the message later. Is that what he's going to do? No. He's going to deliver the whole message of Jesus Christ. Okay? And uh, there was a positive result. See, as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Okay? But not all the results were so positive. See, the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. All right? When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy, and they began contradicting the things spoken by Paul were blaspheming. See, now that opposition once again develops, okay? And Paul is going to have to have enough faith to keep on going, keep firing, keep taking those forward steps, because uh, this is going to get ugly, Okay? See, they're filled with jealousy. See, I mean, you can see these guys saying, we've been having a synagogue meeting here. You know, we've got some Gentiles that kind of sit around in the back. We never had the whole town come out. You know, this guy shows up from nowhere, you know, making some bodacious claims, and everybody comes out to hear him. See, jealousy is a big factor, and don't ever discount that. Jealousy and envy, they are big factors in opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ, Okay. They were contradicting things spoken by Paul. They were blasting. I've been in Bible studies where everything, every point that I made was contested. Every, every, didn't, they didn't know what point I was going to make until I made it, but no matter what it was, they argued against it. Okay. And uh, you know, that, that's what it would be like. This, this is kind of public going on. So Paul and Barnabas' response, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it's necessary the word of God to be spoken to you first. Since you repudiate it, listen to these words. And judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. Those are powerful words. You, judge you, guys, you just judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Think of the courage it took for the guy to say that. Mm -hmm. See, God allows, in the midst of their apostleships and everything, their personalities. See, that's why you see Peter with the personality he has. You see the Apostle John with his personality. You see God, Paul, he, he's got his personality, see. And uh, says, so you got to judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Whose problem is this? It's not his. You guys. So he followed that up with a powerful line. He says, so, so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. Boy, you talk about tweaking the nose of the Jews. You start bringing the fact that you're going to go to the Gentiles in. Nothing gets them more upset at that. You know, in Acts chapter 22, when Paul finished preaching, and he talked about how, I mean, it wasn't Acts 22:16 uh, that got the boys riled up in those days. It was when he said, you know, discussion with, with Jesus. 
he said, you know, hey, uh, they're going to listen to me. You know, they know my former manner of life. Jesus said, no, they won't. He said, go, for I'm going to send you far away to the Gentiles. When, Jesus, when Paul said that to the crowd, they, I mean, they tore off their coats and they started throwing dust in the air and everything else. I mean, they're hot over to the Gentiles. So when, when Paul and Barnabas say this, I placed you as a light to the Gentiles, bring salvation to earth. Those temperatures are rising. You can believe that. <clears throat> so Paul and Barnabas then, their, uh, their response to the, uh, the, the host here's the hostile Jews response then. <clears throat> but the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas, drove them out of the district. Okay? <clears throat> so here we go. Antioch of Pisidia, preach for two weeks, get run out of town. Okay? Uh, so they shook off the their dust of their feet in protest against them, went on to Iconium. <laughs> you know, there he is. Jesus said, you know, if they don't receive you, shake off the dust of your feet. So there they are publicly outside the city, shaking the dust off their feet. Uh, <clears throat> Jews going to know what that means and, and going on to the next city, Iconium. Here's a map of the uh, first missionary journey. Uh, and uh, so you can see Jerusalem would be down there at the uh, lower right. You can see Antioch kind of upper left. Uh, they kind of take a swing towards Cyprus in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea there. And then up toward the center top where you can see Antioch. And then they're going to swing to, to the right over to Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. So this is, you know, basically the thrust of the first missionary journey uh, after they finished at Cyprus. So when they finished up then the... Uh, the missionary journey, in the next slide, says, uh, when they'd appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they believed. You know, that, that's, a, that's a tough deal, too, in the area of faith. Uh, okay, all you can do is go in and preach, get a congregation started, you know, obviously going to try to lay the hands on people, have them receive gifts of the Holy Spirit, which it doesn't particularly talk about. But we know that that was the custom all the way through. Uh, get these congregations off the ground. In this case, they had guys that were qualified to be elders. Um, they, uh, they appointed them elders. Now, the Greek word there, appointed, is an interesting word. It, it's a keratoneo, which means to appoint through the stretching forth of the hands. In other words, they're actually laying hands on them to, to appoint them, as indicated, say, in books like 1 Timothy chapter 5. And then they commended them to the Lord in whom they believe, and uh, time to go. Okay. Before they left, they told those congregations, say, we've got a little message for you guys. It says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. The scripture over and over is saying, look, it, it is, it, they're going to have tough times for your faith. You're going to maintain your faith. It's not going to necessarily be an easy ride for you. You know, somebody's promising you an easy ride. They're not telling you the truth. You know, Paul told these guys, it's going to be a lot of tribulations here to going to enter the kingdom of God. And uh, that's easy to think about theoretically. It get, doesn't get so easy when you think about it personally. You know, Jeff was talking about, you know, his Lord's Supper meditation. You know, one of the things that's clear to him is, you know, how important it is that we be able to have physical interaction with each other. You know, see each other, you know, wave, uh, you know, have a conversation. You know, things like that are so important to our Christianity. And and sometimes when you, you don't you don't realize sometimes what you got until you don't have it anymore. You know, freedom in America is kind of under the same same fight. You know, you, get, you know, Katie was telling me that somebody is able to escape from Venezuela and say, "Okay, Americans, you really need to pay attention here to what's going on." See, because we're we're headed very rapidly down the road to tyranny, and they're going to use this this crisis here to, you know, do mandatory tracking and mandatory vaccination and mandatory, you know, medical ID cards is where they're headed for it. If Dr. Fauci has his way, that's exactly, he's already said that. So you realize that that's Nazi Germany or, or Communist Soviet Union, any of those places. See, so we got to be willing to maintain our faith here, recognize through many tribulations we might enter the kingdom of God. Paul recalled to Timothy about that first missionary journey. Um, he said, remember what persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured. 
in the Lord, out of all, the Lord rescued me. See, I mean, it's much more than Luke describes in the book of Acts. You know, Paul says, Timothy, you remember, okay? Timothy was converted on that first missionary journey. So, to get back to Antioch and the big problem now starting to develop in Antioch, the, uh, the Jewish guys, they want the Gentiles to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. So, when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them in Antioch, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and others of them should go up to Jerusalem, apostles and elders concerning this issue. So Peter testified about the Gentiles coming into the body of Christ. Paul and Barnabas testified about the miracles that God did among the Gentiles, saying God wouldn't be doing those miracles if he wasn't happy with it. And then James quoted scripture. So Paul and Barnabas were actually commended by the leadership in Jerusalem. They sent a letter uh, verified with the uh, eyewitnesses here of the meeting. It said, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, you know, they recognize that Paul and Barnabas risked their lives on that first missionary journey. And it's interesting to me that the eldership in Jerusalem, they kill, still put Barnabas in front of Paul. See, they're, they're not getting... You know, I mean, Luke, right away, he changes it. He says, Paul and his companions, see, up, up, to the, act, act, up to Acts 13, it's been Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Paul, Saul. When he changes his name to Paul, now it's Paul and his companions, see. But the church in Jerusalem, leadership haven't got that. Now, Paul's got to have enough faith to take things like that with a good attitude and keep driving forward, not to allow anything like that to discourage him. There's a lot of, lot of discouragements, a lot of... A lot of shots you're going to take as a Christian, and uh, you got to just be willing to take them and keep a good attitude, keep going. He said, therefore, we've sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. So on the second missionary journey, 49 to 52, uh, Barnabas and Paul had a, had a little split. So Paul chose Silas and left being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. Traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthened churches, so he came to Antioch and he went to uh, Tarsus, and then he went on inland to, to Lystra, and in Lystra he picked up Timothy. He said, Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because the Jews were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. See, Paul's experience here is, is growing as well. See, first missionary journey of just Paul and Barnabas. See, Paul knows he's got to have more. It's Paul and Silas, see, but now he's picking up Timothy, Okay. And so they circumcised him. Here's Paul's second missionary journey here. Map of that. Um, guys, can you find a map back there? Okay, there's a map of the second missionary journey. Once again, you see Jerusalem lower right. You see the arrow goes up to Antioch, kind of centered right. Then it kind of heads uh, left into the previous places, Lystra, Iconium. And then it's going to bounce. You can kind of see the, the big arrow kind of bouncing around there. Um, Paul wanted to go to Ephesus. Ephesus is right in the center of that particular map. You probably can't read the writing from where you're at. <clears throat> Ephesus is just about center, just a little above center. And uh, Paul has got Ephesus in his crosshairs because that's the big town. And, uh, but the Holy Spirit prevents him from getting in there. So he just keeps getting pushed further northwest. Finally ends up with Troy, you know, which is kind of uh, just a little bit underneath the, the S under Paul apostrophe S. Okay? So on the next slide, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man from Macedonia was standing and appealing to him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So when we had seen the vision immediately, we, okay, that means Luke joined him sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Okay, when, when, even when God gave these guys vision, they had to draw some conclusions. Okay, these, are, these are men operating under free will. So Luke joins them. Now he's got you know, Luke and, 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 and Timothy and, and Silas. Okay? So they're going to cross over to, from Asia to Europe. Now there's no synagogue in Philippi. So Paul goes down by the river in accordance with Jewish custom. Once again, he's operating by faith. He doesn't know what's down there. He hopes. There's no synagogue in Philippi. So according to Jewish custom, maybe there's some people meeting down by the riverside for prayer. 
All there were were some God-fearing Gentile women, a lady in her household. So what's Paul going to do? He's going to preach to them. Immerse them. Okay? And he keeps going back to this place of prayer, preaching, preaching, preaching. Because nothing happened, but he's still going back, preaching, 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 right? Finally, he's thrown in jail for casting a demon out of the gal. And he immerses the jailer, forces the judges to come down and apologize. Then he has to leave town. And he leaves Luke to work with the church, okay? He's, he's a man of great faith. And then he goes to the synagogue in Thessalonica. According to Paul's custom, he went to them for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the Scriptures. And some Jews were persuaded, along with a great number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. Okay. But the Jews, begin becoming jealous, taking along some of the wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob, set the city in an uproar. Okay. This is what Paul encounters time after time after time. Does he keep going? He does. That is, you know, if you process that, that is a man of tremendous faith. The brethren immediately sent Paul. See, if he doesn't have faith, he's not going to do it. If he doesn't think some good's going to come out, he's not going to do it. See, it's his faith that's, that's being tested here. So the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Okay. Pay dirt. <clears throat> These were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Result? Many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Okay, so the Jews from Thessalonica come 30 miles in to run Paul out of, Bar uh, Paul out of Berea. Okay, <laughs> that's, a, that's you know, pretty hostile. Okay, so Paul comes to Athens alone. And he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. See, and now he's down in the marketplace every day, talking, talking in the marketplace. The, the Epicurean, Stoic philosophers, mixing it up. See, down there in the marketplace, say, maybe something will happen down here. Maybe I'll meet somebody. Maybe I'll get a contact. See, <clears throat> down there working, see, trusting God. The result is he gets invited to preach on Mars Hill, Areopagus. He gets a congregation going, and he leaves town. <clears throat> he goes to Corinth alone. <clears throat> see, he joins up with a fellow Jew named Aquila, who also has a trade of tent making. Paul gets there, he doesn't have any money. So what he's got to do is he's got to make tents for a while. So he, um, his reason in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade the Jews and Greeks, that's all he can work with to start with is the Jews. But uh, when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. They came with money. They came with some financing. Paul commented to the church at Philippi that time and time again, the church at Philippi had kept him going. See, it, it takes faith to be operating without money. Keep doing what you're doing without money. And it, it had to depend on God. I mean, he worked as a tent maker, but that isn't what he wanted to keep doing. See, so when the Jews resisted and blasphemed, Paul went to the Gentiles. He went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God, God for a Gentile, whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. That's amazing. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing, were being immersed. That's pretty awesome. <clears throat> the Lord himself appeared to Paul in, by night in a vision. He said, do not be afraid any longer. Go on speaking. Do not be silent. I'm with you. No man will attack you in order to harm you. I've got a lot of people in this city. What an encouragement that was. It's, that's the first encouragement he gets. Synagogue, 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 run out of town, run out of town, run out of town. <clears throat> How's it going to go in Corinth? Don't worry, Paul. Nothing going to happen to you here. So he settled there a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. <clears throat> then he went back to, uh, headed back toward Antioch. He remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren, put out to sea for Syria. With him were Priscilla and Aquila. They came to Ephesus. He left them there. So he still got Ephesus in those crosshairs. Wanting to get to Ephesus. He reasoned with the Jews in the synagogue. And a man of faith said, I will return to you again if God wills. Doesn't know, but he believes he'll get back, okay? And when he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, went down to Antioch. And that's how his second missionary journey ended. You can just see him, the last of it there uh, from Ephesus, that, that sea coast run, okay? Third missionary journey, 53 to 57. 
And having spent some time there, he passed successively through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthened the disciples, <clears throat> passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus. Again, the third missionary journey looks like this. Starts with Antioch there on the right. The uh, arrow kind of sweeps around. Uh, head straight to Ephesus. You know, spend some time in Galatia up there and work in those churches. Head straight to Ephesus. So the bulk of the third missionary journey is going to take place in Ephesus. Continued in, in, in the synagogues, continued out speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning, persuading them about the kingdom of God. Some were coming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people. He withdrew from them, took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of tyranny. He's not going to stop this guy. Okay, can't preach in the synagogue anymore. <clears throat> going to set it up in a, in a meeting place. Okay. This took place two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. He had some faith challenges in Ephesus. It doesn't talk about in the book of Acts. In 1 Corinthians 15, 32, he said, If from human motives I fought with the wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? He had to go hand-to-hand -hand combat with the wild beast. One place he talked about how he was delivered from the lion's mouth. Yeah. Um, he said, I do not want you to, we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves. <clears throat> Thought he's going to die in Ephesus. That's a faith challenge. You know, that's a major persecution. Does he keep going? He does. So once again, he's going to sweep over there on your left. He's going to do some time in Greece. Uh, then he's going to have to make his way back to Philippi by land. He's going to head to Troas, and he's going to come back to Jerusalem. <clears throat> so when he gets to Jerusalem, he gets arrested. He has to deliver a message to the Jews from the steps of the Antonia. Remember, he was actually being beat to death by the mob in the temple grounds. The, the, the soldiers actually had to carry him to rescue him from the mob. So what's he do? When he gets the opportunity, he turns around and he stands preaches to those guys. That is a man of faith. That is a man of faith. He said, brethren, I am a Pharisee. Uh, later on, when he's you know, on trial again before the Sanhedrin, he says, brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of the Pharisees. I'm on trial for the hope and resurrection for the dead. And that resulted in a major uproar between the Pharisees and Sadducees. He knew it would. See, he knows the statement. He, he's a man of courage. He's going to say, look, this is, <clears throat> this is why I'm on trial. His nephew and heard about a plot to kill Paul. Paul had his nephew talk to the commander, resulting in Paul's being taken to Caesarea down on the seacoast. Now he's going to appear before the Jewish governor, or the Roman governor, Felix, wife Drusilla. She's one of the descendants of Herod the Great. Um, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ. Okay, now here, here's Saul of Tarsus, or Paul, uh, the apostle Paul, prisoner before the Roman governor, right? Should be pleading for his release, right? As he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix became frightened. That's a lot of courage. That's a lot of faith, okay? When he stands before uh, Festus and Agrippa, comes this meeting, huge pomp. Everybody's, everybody's there in the, you know, roughly equivalent to Denver, the regional capital, okay? And so it comes in with, the, the audience comes in with great pomp. Paul's talking, he said, you know, Festus said, you're out of your mind. Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. Saying that to the governor. This is a man of faith. This is a man who's going to preach, teach. He's going to put the word out there. He says, King Agrippa, you believe the prophets? I know you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you'll persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these change. I'm better placed than you are, Agrippa. Spent more than two years in jail in Caesarea, and he actually had to make his appeal to Caesar in that process. Okay, how's his faith? Is he getting discouraged in there? This is a great man. I hope that's, hope that's coming through to us. You know, what a great man of faith Paul was. He's caught in a major storm. Okay? He had enough 
I guess presence by this point, he led the whole crew and passengers in prayer. Well over 200. Okay. He had the respect of the soldiers. When the, when the sailors were going to let the, the, their long boat out, Paul said to the soldiers who were guarding him, cut the boat, cut the ropes. <clears throat> you don't cut the ropes or we're, we're all going to perish. They cut the ropes. He had a major impact on the island of Malta. You know, to this day, there's a lot of, a lot of references to Paul on Malta. Finally he arrived in Rome where he's escorted by the brethren. Had tremendous faith and courage before the Jews in Rome. When they set the day for Paul, they came to his lodging at large numbers. He's explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God, trying to persuade them concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets from morning to evening. So preaching. House arrest. Preaching. Some were persuaded, some were not. When they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. What do you suppose that was? Okay. Go to this people and say, keep on listening, do not understand. Keep on hearing, but do not perceive. That's, that's the parting word. In Rome, he kept right on preaching the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ for two years while under house arrest. He, we can tell that he did make his appeal to Caesar. He was released. He's put in prison again, and as we can tell, Mamertine Prison, which is a prison that was built in about 600 B.C. Uh, not a nice place, in case you're wondering. And uh, he was finally executed by the order, and as we can tell, of Emperor Nero, sometime prior between 64 and 67 A.D., and as we can tell, they chopped his head off. He said, from prison, just before his death. He said, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. What a great man of faith, right to the end. You know, we want to be able to say those words. I fought the fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. Okay. So the point would be then that uh, in order for us to be able to say at the end that we kept the faith at the end, we need to be keeping the faith now. See, what we do now will actually carry over. Uh, human beings, more than they realize, are creatures of habit. And we're basically going to finish our lives the way we lived. Okay. And uh, those of you who work with people, you know, you, you know, as they're in their last days, you recognize that. Uh, that, you know, what they've been all their lives, that's, that's what they're going to be in the process of passing away. Very rarely that you can get somebody like the lady Marcia was working with that right at the end will, will actually turn. But she'd been studying for years, so it wasn't. But, see, so that, that lets us know. We need to be the kind of people that are people of faith and uh, moving forward. And uh, having great attitudes regardless of whatever external circumstances that we encounter.